Welcome back. We're in the middle of a discussion of Article 3 of the Constitution, the Judiciary Article, and we've been talking about something that modern people refer to as judicial review, the power and indeed the duty of judges to refuse to enforce laws that they, in their independent judgment, deem unconstitutional, uh, even though those laws have been passed by the House of Representatives and the Senate, signed by a president or um, passed over a president's veto, even though these laws have been duly enacted in a procedural sense, judges have the power and indeed the duty to, to refuse to enforce those laws if they deem them unconstitutional. We call that judicial review. Uh, it's not something that's explicitly in the Constitution in so many words, but I think it's a deep part of the Constitution's overall text read holistically and structure. The argument is not that because there's a thing called the Supreme Court and the Constitution is supreme law, that judges uh, on the Supreme Court have some unique power. The, ju the justices on the Supreme Court are generally supreme over the other judges. There's a kind of a, a judicial pyramid. Supreme Court justices can overturn courts of appeals um, and below them uh, trial courts. Um, but the Supreme Court is not really supreme over the other branches, just over the other courts. And this power of, of holding something refu uh, unconstitutional, of refusing to give effect for something that you think is unconstitutional, is not limited to su the Supreme Court. It's true of all other federal judges. It's true of state judges. We're going to see to some extent at the founding, people thought it was true of jurors. The power uh, to um, refuse to um, give effect to something that you deem unconstitutional is, is a power, as we've seen, shared in some ways by other branches of government as well. The House can just say no and refuse to vote for a law it thinks is unconstitutional, even if it knows the courts would uphold it or have upheld a very similar law. So too with the Senate. Presidents can veto laws that they, that they believe are unconstitutional. Call that um, 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 even if courts would uphold those laws or have upheld them. Think of Andrew Jackson um, refusing to sign um, a new bank bill even after John Marshall's Supreme Court had, had upheld the constitutionality of a federal bank in McCullough versus Maryland. Um, Presidents can even refuse to enforce certain bills that they think are unconstitutional, at least until a court case materializes. There's a kind of executive review in the Constitution alongside judicial review. Um, and remember, presidents are made independent of the legislature, too. They're not picked just by the, ordinarily just by, by the, the, the legislature. They're picked through an independent electoral college system. They have undiminishable salary, um, and indeed their salary can't be increased either. Uh, judges can be increased, so they're vulnerable to uh, possible congressional bribery, but presidential salaries within a four-year term can be neither increased nor decreased. They've got a term of office independent of the legislature, four years rather than for life. But there's a thing called executive review, really, alongside judicial review. Remember that um, Thomas Jefferson is going to pardon everyone that he um, that has been convicted under a Sedition Act, even after Supreme Court justices writing circuit have upheld the Sedition Act against constitutional challenge. Um, uh, so the basic argument for what we call judicial review is not necessarily something unique about the judiciary. It simply follows from, from two basic facts. One, the Constitution is the supreme law of the land. It trumps an ordinary statute, whether a congressional statute or a state statute. Why is it the supreme law of the land? Because it comes more authentically from the people. It's a more democratic law than a law passed by an ordinary Congress. So the Constitution and its amendments come more directly from the people. Amendments are much more difficult to adopt than ordinary statutes. And so because an amendment was hard to adopt, it should be hard to change. An ordinary statute should not suffice to, in effect, undo an amendment that required two-thirds of the House, two-thirds of the Senate, three-quarters of the states. Um, a much broader um, uh, process generated the Constitution itself and its amendments. And so ordinary statutes actually rank lower in their democratic pedigree. The Constitution is the supreme law of the land. That's the first step. And the second step is, and judges enforce law. 
Um, judges are supposed to follow law, and if the Constitution is inconsistent with the statute, they're supposed to follow the Constitution in the same way that if a valid federal law is inconsistent with a state statute, they're supposed to follow the valid federal law because of the supremacy clause actually in, of the Constitution, which we'll talk about in later lectures. It's in Article 6. It says the Constitution is the supreme law and then congressional statutes, but only ones that are consistent with the Constitution in pursuance of the Constitution. And then below that, state constitutions and state statutes and, and, and so on. And that's the, the democratic hierarchy of law. And judicial review is basically just a recognition of the supremacy of the Constitution as the supreme law of the land and the fact that judges are supposed to enforce law. Now, um, that's the basic argument of the Federalist Number 78 in support of what we call judicial review. It's um, a basic argument that you see in an opinion by John Marshall in 1803 for the court called Marbury versus Madison. Um, but exactly how robust a conception of judicial review did the framers envision? I suggest at the founding it was rather modest. Here are a few reasons for thinking so. First, remember that the Constitution doesn't specify the size of the Supreme Court. Now, if the Supreme Court was going to be invalidating um, uh, this, uh, 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 acts of Congress right and left, if it was going to be as important, as, say, as the president and the veto process or something, you'd think that the framers would have specified much more how many justices there would be. Um, in the same way that they, there was a lot of wrangling about apportionment of the House of Representatives, apportionment of the Senate, how the Electoral College was to be structured. If the Supreme Court was basically an organ of national power that was designed to make sure that the states complied with the Constitution, um, then you could um, imagine that the, fra the framers actually um, were going to leave to Congress a lot of power over the size and shape of, of the court. Um, so in the same way that Congress would decide how to structure a post office, how to structure the Treasury Department, Congress could structure the judiciary as an organ of national power to monitor the states. And by the way, um, that idea of monitoring, of the judiciary monitoring the states is an idea that went back to the colonial era. Um, uh, when colonists passed laws in their assemblies, um, uh, judges um, uh, in uh, uh, the Privy Council um, could, um, uh, judges and, and other officials of the central government could invalidate congressional, excuse me, uh, uh, colonial um, uh, laws. And, and the framers of the Constitution thought that the state legislatures actually sort of needed a little bit of checking um, and monitoring, a little bit of oversight um, from the new central government that they were trying to create. They were trying to create, in effect, a little bit of a substitute for the review of colonial statutes um, embodied in, in the Privy Council. And indeed, early on, John Marshall's court strikes down lots and lots of state laws. He's, he's siding with the federal government, his, he and his Supreme Court, John Marshall, in validating state laws as violative of federal statutes and the federal constitution. Um, so lots of invalidations of state laws. Basically on Marshall's watch, only one invalidation of a congressional statute. That's in Marbury versus Madison. I think that's consistent with the idea that the Supreme Court's size isn't specified. Now, by the way, be precisely because its size isn't specified, its apportionment rules, it's going to be vulnerable eventually to a pro-slavery tilt. Our, uh, because of the three-fifths clause, the Congress tilts toward the South. Because of the three-fifths clause, the presidency tilts toward the South. Pro-slavery presidents like Andrew Jackson eventually become sort of dominant, and they can appoint pro-slavery judges, and they can uh, sign into law pro-slavery apportionment rules. By the time of the Dred Scott case in the 1850s, the Supreme Supreme Court is apportioned, so that even though the slaveholding South has less than a third of America's free population, it has more than a uh, it has a majority on the Supreme Court. So it's kind of malapportioned, and and that's going to create some problems. That um, when it, when um, that malapportioned court gives us the Dred Scott case, um, the original Supreme Court had six members, an even number. How odd. 
Uh, because, you see, if it's supposed to be deciding all the important constitutional issues, you'd imagine that you'd want an odd number so that um, four could beat three or five could, could trump four. But originally, it's six. That's another sign that they're not imagining the framers are the Supreme Court as um, the kind of um, um, massive um, force it's become uh, in American history. Here's another little clue. When presidents veto bills, they are supposed to actually give a written statement of reasons for vetoing the bill, send a message back to Congress, and um, the Constitution prescribes all of that. And many of the early veto messages are, in fact, based on constitutional objections, as we talked about in earlier lectures. About half of the early vetoes, roughly two dozen out of 50, say, um, in the antebellum, the pre-Civil War period, roughly half of them are constitutional vetoes. And the Constitution is imagining, the framers were imagining the veto as an important mechanism of constitutional oversight, a check and balance of the legislature. But judicial opinions, not so much. There's nothing in the written Constitution that says that judicial opinions even have to be written um, and the way that the veto message is. There's nothing that says there has to be an opinion of the court. Um, and indeed, before John Marshall comes along, there isn't actually an opinion of the court as such. Individual justices um, kind of give their op opinions from the bench randomly, um, and sometimes there's someone to write it down, not um, always the, the, um, their opinions so are not collective, they're not immediately published. John Marshall is going to change all of that. Um, but that's yet another signal that early um, that, that the framers did not quite imagine judicial review to be as robust as it becomes. Um, in all of Marshall's time on the court, he strikes down one federal statute. It's in a case called Marbury versus Madison. He strikes down lots of state statutes, but only one federal statute. And that federal statute is regulating the judiciary itself. Um, the flaw in the statute, as Marshall saw it, was that the statute improperly expanded the original jurisdiction of the Supreme Court, giving them cases to hear at trial that they should instead have been hearing on appeal. So a very technical issue involving the judiciary itself. That's the only time before 1850 that the Supreme Court invalidates an act of Congress, even though it's invalidating lots and lots of state laws, as I said. And even though presidents are vetoing all sorts of bills on constitutional grounds, and they're vetoing bills that courts have upheld or will uphold, see, for example, Jackson's veto of the bank. Presidents are pardoning people that courts have actually said don't have a good defense. See Thomas Jefferson's pardon uh, uh, of uh, people who uh, were accused of violating the Sedition Act. So um, if all of that is so, if the judiciary originally is sort of more a branch of the central government monitoring states, making sure that states comply with the Constitution and with valid federal laws, by the way, that's McCulloch versus Maryland, upholding a congressional scheme um, and invalidating um, a federal bank, a state effort to tax that bank and undo it. So that's paradigmatic of the Marshall Court. John Marshall, a former congressperson himself, siding with Congress against the states and in uh, so doing, kind of carrying forward a theme from the colonial experience of, of uh, members of the central government monitoring uh, local compliance uh, with um, uh, uh, empire-wide, continent-wide um, uh, rules. So if, if that's uh, early-style judicial review with only one important invalidation of an act of Congress by the Supreme Court and that an act involving the judiciary itself, how is it... Um, and by the way, um, state courts um, uh, in the early um, uh, revolutionary period had exercised judicial review um, um, by invalidating state statutes, which were seen as that were seen as violating state constitutions. But most of those early examples of state-style judicial review involved judiciary-specific um, laws, laws about juries, for example. So how is it then, you might ask, that this founding uh, judiciary, the least dangerous branch, third out of three, pretty modest, um, doesn't get to pick its own 
um, subordinates. Um, Supreme Court justices can't pick lower court judges, doesn't get to pick his own leaders. Justices can't pick the, the chief justice, doesn't get to, um, to have an absolute right to regulate its own procedures or evidence. Its, its shape can be manipulated by Congress. You, Congress can add to it or subtract from the size of the justices if they don't like the, the rulings of the current justices. If all of that is so, how is it that the judiciary has become uh, much more powerful over time. Um, supreme in some sense, uh, arguably, um, uh, even over other branches, or at least some Supreme Court justices uh, think that, and ordinary people think that, that there's a unique um, power and duty of courts, um, uh, and among them the Supreme Court, and court judges more than juries to say what the law is and enforce the Constitution. Well, I think a few factors are at play, um, and let's just talk about them, and they're post-founding factors. One, a lot more judges today. At the founding, there are um, only 15 lower court judges, and there they're soon become 105 or so members of the House of Representatives. Seven Congress people for every, uh, several, seven representatives for every judge. Today, there are about two federal judges for every member of the House of Representatives. That's a 15-fold increase in the, the ratio of judges to members of Congress. Today, Lawyers, young lawyers, are much more likely to start their careers clerking for a judge than interning for a member of Congress. So one thing, the judiciary has become powerful just because there are a lot more of them. You know, the old joke, friends come and go, but enemies accumulate. Well, judges accumulate. And the Supreme Court sits atop this ever-increasing pyramid. When we have more laws, more complex laws, we need more, need more judges to implement them. A huge judicial pyramid with also, um, 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 with uh, radiating power um, uh, in various districts, you may be more likely to know a federal judge than, a, than your own member of the House of Representatives. Congress can't expand infinitely. Congress has about 500 people now, 435 in the House. If it were 4,000, it would be even more dysfunctional than at 400. And if it were 40,000, you know, all the more. Judges, you can keep expanding that pyramid. So that's one thing that happened. Second thing that happened is judges got control over their docket, um, a thing called certiorari. The justices could decide which cases they were going to hear, and, and that gives them the power and effect to define a kind of legislative agenda. In the early period, almost all the important issues actually are resolved outside the judiciary. Um, uh, should there, um, uh, 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 should, can presidents um, fire cabinet officers at will? Can the federal government assume state war debts? Um, is a bank of the United States constitutional? That doesn't reach the Supreme Court until 30 years after the founding uh, debates about all of this. Uh, can presidents negotiate um, treaties um, secretly? Can they um, issue neutrality proclamations? Is the Sedition Act unconstitutional. Um, issue after issue after issue, the, the, big, the big ones don't come before the Supreme Court. On the Sedition Act, for example, the Supreme Court doesn't have, as such, appellate jurisdiction over all federal criminal cases. Um, and it only gets that late in the 19th century. Justices are riding circuit and, um, and deciding cases individually, but not quite as a Supreme Court. So. More judges, that's one answer. Second, they, have, they get to hear more cases. These restrictions on their jurisdiction are gradually, gradually fall away. They have more, the Supreme Court has more control over its docket. It it's now sits atop a huge pyramid of, of federal judges who, all, all, um, who can be seen as just so many lieutenants enforcing Supreme Court mandates. Um, uh, we have a series of amendments that are designed with judicial review in mind to, to create judicially enforceable rights, especially after the Civil War, rights against states and the federal government. And the courts are very vigilant in enforcing rights against states, as we've seen. That's going to be the story of the Reconstruction Amendments. We have the emergence of divided government in the 20th century. So when the Congress is controlled by a different party than the president, they're at loggerheads. And so courts can do lots more stuff. And no matter what they do, they're not going to get invalidated because either the president will like it or the Congress will like it. And either the president or the Congress can stop any law that would try to retaliate against the justices or overturn their controversial decision. So in a world of unified government, where the House, the Senate, the presidency are all dominated by the same party, judges have less ability to sort of smack down 
uh, political actions because they can in turn be retaliated against by a unified House Senate presidency. But in the modern era, we don't have that so much. We have um, post Watergate and Vietnam a sense that our political branches have lied to us, um, and the courts actually have been part of the, the solution, the, the Nixon tapes case, the Pentagon Papers case. Um, so presidents are seen now as partisan officials, and um, uh, that wasn't true of George Washington, whereas justices have pr positioned themselves um, as, as sort of more above party. Whether that's true or not, um, um, that's actually the... The, the, the persona. Um, um, so, so a whole bunch of reasons, I think, why judges today are much more powerful than before and many, many more acts of judicial review. Um, uh, in the modern era, the Supreme Court about twice a year is invalidating, three times a year, is invalidating an act of Congress. In the entire period before 1850, there was one invalidation of an act of Congress. That's called Marbury versus Madison. It was a judiciary specific law. So, um, so today, as I said, in the modern era, the court every year is, is as robust against Congress or more than in the entire period before 1850. So we've talked a bit about judges. Let me tell you a couple more things about um, Article Three. It gives judges power to hear all federal cases and uh, it's not at all clear that Congress can take that power away from federal courts. It might be able to reallocate, give power to one federal court or another court, but Congress is limited in its ability to take away all federal cases of a certain sort from the federal judiciary. So said John Marshall's court in an important case called Martin versus Hunter's lessee. Um, and uh, let me just say a word or two about juries, and then I'm going to come back to the picture of John Marshall. I've been talking about judges a lot because today judges are the main event. When we say Article Three, we think judges. But for the framers, juries were a lower house of a bicameral judiciary. They were an important part of the process. They are mentioned in Article Three. Criminal cases have to be tried to a jury under Article Three. The Anti-Federalists said, that's not enough. We want more protections for juries. What about civil juries? You're not specifying that uh, the jury, for example, has to come from a certain district or, or vicinage. Um, so um, uh, we need uh, more protections for juries than you are recognizing. Even Marbury versus Madison, by the way, can be thought of as involving jury rights. Why would you not want the original jurisdiction of the Supreme Court to be expanded? because the Supreme Court's going to be sitting in Washington, D.C., um, and, um, and if it gets to hear a case, then a local jury isn't participating. But if instead the Supreme Court doesn't hear the case and some other lower federal court hears it in the hinterlands, there's going to be a local jury involved. So the whole debate about the Bill of Rights in the ratification process, when, the, when critics say, hey, you forgot the rights, is precipitated in part by a criticism of Article Three, saying, you know, it mentions juries, but not robustly enough. Not civil juries, not enough protection for juries. It mentions criminal procedure. It says in impeachment, uh, excuse me, in for treason, it says that things have to happen in open court and there have to be two witnesses to a treason. But what about all the other rights of, of criminal defendants? What about rights of counsel and against double jeopardy and the right not to be compelled to incriminate yourself um, um, and, and so on? It says treason can only, uh, will consist only of levering war against the United States. It's kind of a protection, therefore, of, uh, of free speech. You can't be prosecuted for treason merely for criticizing the government. But you didn't say so that explicitly. Why isn't there more explicit protection of free speech and free expression? So this treason clause, which can be seen as a kind of proto-Bill of Rights, the jury provisions of Article Three, which can be seen of as a seed crystal of the Bill of Rights, precipitate a conversation saying, you know, we need a lot more rights. Um, and, and that's going to lead to a Bill of Rights. So Article Three is in some ways a gateway to um, the early amendments. Now before I conclude, I just wanted to come back, because I promised I would, to this picture that that's, um, uh, begins Chapter 6 of uh, uh, of America's Constitution of Biography. Every chapter begins with a picture, and if you understand the picture, you understand the lecture. This is John Marshall. 
He's the great early Chief Justice, and before he comes along, the Supreme Court actually is practically impotent. And he makes it the Supreme Court. After Marshall, the justices are going to speak actually with an opinion of the court, which the Constitution doesn't require. And they're going to issue written opinions, which the Constitution doesn't require. So his kind of counterpart to the president's veto message. And he is going to invalidate all sorts of state laws that are inconsistent with the federal scheme, but he's not going to pick too many fights with Congress because he's going to lose that. His branch isn't as powerful. It is the least dangerous uh, to begin with. He's himself a former congressperson, a former diplomat, very popular, and he helps establish judicial review in Marbury versus Madison, but he doesn't push it too far. In general, he's, his court is going to be upholding federal exercises of power, like the federal bank, and invalidating state laws that interfere um, um, with that. Um, he's going to give us the idea of a modern Supreme Court. He's going to stick around for a very long time, showing that life tenure, this good behavior, means something. Before him, chief justices left early. They didn't have to, but they chose to leave early. So just as Washington establishes a tradition that the presidency, although he can be reelected uh, again and again, presidency should end after two terms, so a kind of a gloss on Article 2. Marshall establishes a gloss on Article 3. No, life tenure means that judges shouldn't leave early. They should stick around to the end. So in earlier um, lectures, I said, well, if you understand George Washington, you see a lot about the early presidency. If you understand Andrew Jackson, you see what the presidency became. If you see Henry Clay, you see Congress as a great um, um, a speechifying body. So three, three big themes about um, the Constitution have emerged um, early on. And if you see John Marshall, you, you, he embodies the, the, the power of the, the, early, um, uh, of the Supreme Court that, 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 that he helps actualize. It's not as clear in the text, but he makes it real. What are the three big themes uh, the, of our story so far? The Constitution is more democratic than we've been told, more pro-slavery than we've been told, and more about national security. Who's John Marshall? He's a very, um, before he was on the Supreme Court, he's a very popular politician, um, a man of the people, um, uh, probably the most um, popular member of his party, the Federalist Party, um, uh, in America, um, especially after um, uh, uh, Hamilton's um, death. So um, a, a former politician becoming a judge. Um, so you see sort of um, uh, writing for ordinary people, writing opinions that ordinary people can understand. So a master practitioner of a kind of, the, um, of, of, of uh, democratic politics. Um, he's from Virginia a slave-holding regime, um, and, um, but he's a critic of slavery. Um, um, and we're going to come back to that uh, in a minute. Um, he, he doesn't think that slavery is this great thing, and that way he's like Washington, like Thomas Jefferson, who's his cousin, by the way. He's also America, one of America's leading diplomats. He understands national security. He comes to national prominence in part as a diplomat in France, and he is a hero of the American Revolution. He's there with George Washington. He's there at Valley Forge. He writes famous opinions upholding national security powers of the federal government and national bank. So democracy, slavery, national security, all embodied in the person of John Marshall. Now, just as George Washington, who is a slaveholder but who frees his slaves and thinks slavery is basically going to be the death of the republic, is ultimately succeeded by Andrew Jackson, who is much more pro-slavery. Um, and, and, and uh, in fact, uh, at least as a, ma a constitutional matter, and will um, and, uh, uh, support the slave power, so John Marshall is going to be succeeded by Roger Taney, whose constitutional vision is much more pro-slavery. Who puts Taney on the court? Andrew Jackson. How does Andrew Jackson become president? The three-fifths clause. So. Marshall is a Virginian who is a critic of slavery. He doesn't want this to be a slaveholding republic forever. He is succeeded, though, by Taney, whose constitutional vision is much more enthusiastically pro-slavery, a Jackson appointee. And because of that, the Dred Scott case, 
um, a man named Lincoln will arise and say, the Constitution is, is skewing far too much in a pro-slavery direction. We have to stop this. And the confrontation between Lincoln's vision and Taney's vision will eventually culminate in the Civil War and the Constitution will be transformed in the process. Um, but that's basically um, the uh, story for, for later lectures. Um, I promise I'll tell that story to you, so stay tuned. Unconstitutional. We call that judicial review. Uh, it's not something that's explicitly in the Constitution in so many words, but I think it's a deep part of the Constitution's overall text read holistically and structure. The argument is not that because there's a thing called the Supreme Court and the Constitution is supreme law, the judges uh, on the Supreme Court have some unique power. The, ju the justices on the Supreme Court are generally supreme over the other judges. There's a kind of a, a judicial pyramid. Supreme Court justices can overturn courts of appeals um, and below them uh, trial courts. Um, but the Supreme Court is not really supreme over the other branches, just over the other courts. And this power of, of holding something refu uh, unconstitutional, of refusing to give effect for something that you think is unconstitutional, is not limited to su the Supreme Court. It's true of all other federal judges. It's true of state judges. We're going to see to some extent at the founding, people thought it was true of jurors. The power uh, to um, refuse to um, give effect to something that you deem unconstitutional is, is a power, as we've seen, shared in some ways by other branches of government as well. The House can just say no and refuse to vote for a law it thinks is unconstitutional, even if it knows the courts would uphold it or have upheld a very similar law. So too with the Senate. Presidents can veto laws that they, that they believe are unconstitutional. Call that um, 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 even if courts would uphold those laws or have upheld them. Think of Andrew Jackson um, refusing to sign um, a new bank bill even after John Marshall's Supreme Court had, had upheld the constitutionality of a federal bank in McCullough versus Maryland. Um, Presidents can even refuse to enforce certain bills that they think are unconstitutional, at least until a court case materializes. There's a kind of executive review in the Constitution alongside judicial review. Um, and remember, presidents are made independent of the legislature, too. They're not picked just by the, ordinarily just by, by the, the, the legislature. They're picked through an independent electoral college system. They have undiminishable salary, um, and indeed their salary can't be increased either. They're, they're, judges can be increased, so they're vulnerable to uh, possible congressional bribery, but presidential salaries within a four-year term can be neither increased nor decreased. They've got a term of office independent of the legislature, four years rather than for life. But there's a thing called executive review, really, alongside. Welcome back. We're in the middle of a discussion of Article Three of the Constitution, the Judiciary Article, and we've been talking about something that modern people refer to as judicial review, the power and indeed the duty of judges to refuse to enforce laws that they, in their independent judgment, deem unconstitutional, uh, even though those laws have been passed by the House of Representatives and the Senate, signed by a president or um, passed over a president's veto, even though these laws have been duly enacted in a procedural sense, judges have the power and indeed the duty to, to refuse to enforce those laws if they deem them a judicial review. Remember that um, Thomas Jefferson is going to pardon everyone that he, um, that has been convicted under a Sedition Act, even after Supreme Court justices writing circuit have upheld the Sedition Act against constitutional challenge. Um, uh, so the basic argument for what we call judicial review is not necessarily something unique about the judiciary. It simply follows from, from two basic facts. One, the Constitution is the supreme law of the land. It 
trumps an ordinary statute, whether a congressional statute or a state statute. Why is it the supreme law of the land? Because it comes more authentically from the people. It's a more democratic law than a law passed by an ordinary Congress. So the Constitution and its amendments come more directly from the people. Amendments are much more difficult to adopt than ordinary statutes. And so because an amendment was hard to adopt,